So, um, so I'm John of, from Greylock, and uh, we, we started talking, I'll introduce Selena in just a second. So um, we started talking with, uh, with the pre-money folks about uh, talking about a class that my partner Reed Hoffman and I did uh, last fall. I guess Reed Hoffman, as you know, one of the five most famous employees of Microsoft, I guess. Um, <laughs> he's also a very nice guy and you know, my partner, and uh, you know, he knows some things about investing and started LinkedIn, I guess. Um, so anyway, so we did, a, we did a class in the fall about something called blitzscaling, which I'll explain in a minute. We thought we'd talk, for the, talk to this group for, for a few minutes about that. I personally think investors are super uninteresting to listen to, and I prefer to listen to entrepreneurs, and so I asked Selena if she would come talk with us for a little bit. She was one of the guests in our class. Um, we're lucky to have Selena. She, um, the old timers in the room will remember a service called Evite, which was one of the most important companies in sort of the Web 1.0 uh, um, era. Selena was also went to IAC, ran a bunch of things at IAC. She ran, she became president, uh, she was CTO and then president of SurveyMonkey. And then, um, and now starting a new company called? GIXO. I can't pronounce it, so it's G-I-X-O. <laughs> yeah. And so I thought she'd be interesting because she's been at scale in a couple of different eras and now is doing an, a seed stage company. Um, and so uh, sh l thinking about the lessons that she can apply from her scaled companies to the seed stage companies, I thought that would be interesting. So this is a little change of pace from, and maybe not a super popular point of view, um, compared to the last, uh, you know, g given the 500 startups um, thesis. But blitzscaling, the idea was that most of the truly large companies in the uh, technology sector come from Silicon Valley. So when Reed and I started looking with our co-instructors, Alan Blue and Chris Ye, and Reed and, Al uh, Reed and Chris are writing a book now called Blitzscaling. When we started looking, we said, well, look, of, all, of the nine truly large companies that have gotten created in the last 15 or so years, six of them came from Silicon Valley. Two of them from China, um, or maybe three of them from China, actually. Uh, oh, no, sorry, one was Tesla, uh, one was, was kind of started in LA, but then Tencent and Alibaba. And then of the 10 private unicorns, the, the biggest ones in the world now, 50% are from Silicon Valley, with two in China and two in LA, and one in India, the top 10. And even in the top 60, 28 came from here, 11 from China, five in Europe, four in India, and three in LA and New York. And so the question is why? So this region only has seven million people. So obviously China has a lot more people than that, New York has a lot more people than that, LA has a lot more people than that. The question is why? Capital is becoming more and more uh, accessible. It's clearly not a question of talent. There's talent everywhere. There's uh, understanding how to start up is happening everywhere. The question is really how you scale. And the thesis, <clears throat> that Reed and I worked through is that we do some unusual things to scale in very, very aggressive ways that uh, look and sometimes are actually irrational. So anyway, <clears throat> so that, that was the class. And we, we brought together the smartest people we could find who scaled, some, uh, some obviously uh, successful and some more controversial. So Jeff Wiener and Sam Altman and Eric Schmidt and Reed Hastings and Elizabeth Holmes from uh, Theranos and Nirav Tolia and Patrick Carlson. And the, the metaphor that we talked about a lot was called blitzscaling, which is unfortunately a war metaphor, which is not my favorite. Reed, Reed likes them more than I do. Um, but the idea is with uh, the German blitz, blitzkrieg is that tanks started rolling and they extended well beyond their supply lines. You can only really do that if you believe you're about to win. So that, that was the idea and we talked about that for a quarter. So anyway, so w what we'll do now is just have a 10 minute conversation with Selena about some of the themes from the class and get her, her points of view. And I'll share some from my experience at Mozilla too. So one of the themes that came up very early <clears throat> was from Sam Altman. And he said, don't grow until you understand you have product market fit. And so I was wondering if you could talk about how you knew you had product market fit at SurveyMonkey or how they did and, and how, what you did then. Sure, so SurveyMonkey had for um, a pretty interesting backstory in the sense that the founder started the company in 1999 and didn't take a, zero, a penny of funding, which is obviously very different. He started in the Midwest um, and he kind of figured out product market fit just by getting consumers to use it. And kind of the unique thing with SurveyMonkey is it obviously has a viral coefficient. So you send surveys, other people see them, and so you didn't need to necessarily spend on marketing dollars in the same way. And so he was able to essentially get the product market fit by just validating consumers were using the service. Um, as we're looking at it now with our new startup, um, we are spending an enormous amount of time talking to consumers and kind of the 
my kind of rule of thumb is as soon as you start hearing the same thing over and over again, that's when you start seeing um, that you learn the themes from consumers. But ultimately, until you build a prototype and start getting it out there and having consumers try it, it's really hard to establish if there's actual product market fit. Um, and so that's kind of the approach we're taking this time. And how did you know that you had product market fit? Did it start just growing or what happened? So again, at SurveyMonkey, the, um, it just started to grow. And even at Evite, um, I, we essentially left the platform alone for about two or three months. And um, I'm an extremely clumsy person and tripped over the cable. And then someone called us and was like, what happened to Evite? And we plugged it back in. And we realized that it had grown on its own. We were very young at the time, so most people check their businesses more often. Um, but again, I think it's a matter of the more consumer usage you can drive and ensure engagement. Like the m a lot of, you can buy consumers up front, but ensuring that they engage and stay with you is by far the biggest metric of consumer product market fit. Yeah, and Sam told us, Sam Altman told a story about Airbnb and about how they, they only had the three of them for the longest time. And it was painfully slow they just couldn't get anything done because there's only three of them, but they were they were determined not to grow until they had real users. And that, that really helped them like develop their North Star and their point of view about what was important about the product so that when they started to see growth, they could they could really step on the gas. It. Yeah. And Mozilla was like where I was is the original example of this, which was like they, they were in the wilderness for probably close to ten years before Firefox started to grow. Um, so another thing that came up was a consistent theme was that Breaking conventional wisdom, but in the right ways, was was key. And so, there's some th stories about that at SurveyMonkey too. Yeah. So I think in terms of one of the besides just essentially waiting 10 years to take funding, and then the founder eventually got to a point where he said, "I actually don't know how to take this to the next level. I don't know how to scale it." So you know, it was doing essentially over 20 million, but couldn't figure out how do I get that and and really um, take it to, I think, what does Reed call it, the village? Or yeah, <laughs> the village is like um, 100 to 1,000 people. And so, um, and so then he went off and got essentially private equity in and brought in Dave Goldberg, who became our CEO. And Dave had the viewpoint very much of, I'm going to do a couple things that are pretty different. One of it was in terms of the talent he hired. So he was very focused on finding people, even though we were an 18-person organization that had both experience with startups and scale. How do you put in that executive team up front so that they can lead you through? Um, the second thing that he did that was, I think, pretty unique is he had the mantra of the 20-mile march, which is we're going to go after this business for the duration. And so rather than necessarily taking all of these investments and all of these profits and investing them back in, which I think a lot of companies do, is how do you actually keep discipline around margin? And um, how do you grow potentially at a more steady, sustainable pace and figure out what those sustainable growth levers are, um, but just balance how much you're reinvesting and keeping that EBITDA there? Yep, and another theme that, we've got two more themes that came out. One was uh, do some things that don't scale for longer than you think you need them. And the, the canonical example here was Eric Schmidt talking about their hiring practice, that Larry and Sergey would review all resumes, certainly for the first thousand people, which I think most, you know, first hundred, first thousand, which I think most startup founders do. But they did it like in well into the tens of thousands of resumes, and maybe they still, still do it somehow. But um, what, what, what things did you do at SurveyMonkey that didn't scale but made sense for you to do? So I think it, in a similar vein, I would say the largest, I don't want to say issue that you have as a person who is trying to scale is people. Um, because you end up putting in people who have, it's how do you find that balance of somebody that wants to get their hands dirty and figuring out will they scale? And also, people are often unwilling to let go of things that they used to do. Um, but as the business grows, you often need to let that go and find somebody in who is a peer who's bringing in experience and moving some responsibility to them. And I think that's the piece where it's like over committing to individuals to say, hey, you're going to be responsible for this whole area. And then as you start growing, you're like, actually, they can't be responsible for the whole area. And it kind of sets you a little bit back footed. And so figuring out how do you set those expectations, which says, hey, we're going to bring you in, but there will probably be a time where we're we may need to split this off from you and kind of setting that up front. And I do feel like that's a place where 
you know, you don't think to do it up front because you want to keep the person as motivated as possible, but it just the, the ramifications are huge. And so, you know, it's, it's trying to figure out that balance with people, I think, is the hardest. Yep. I think for Mozilla, was that we had a lot of face-to-face -face meetings, even though we had people all around the world. And so I was willing to spend whatever it took to have people meet face-to-face because -face it really uh, developed relationships that couldn't be developed over IRC, which was proto-Slack, more yeah. or less. Um, and so then I guess the last, the last thing, the, the strongest theme that came through, it was amazing watching people who are extremely successful, Marissa or Reed Hastings or Jeff Wiener or Reed Hoffman, they all, all except for one guest, and I won't mention who that is, <laughs> talked about how important mentorship was. And uh, you, I mean, I've, I, my relationship with Reed was a mentorship relationship as I was building Mozilla and Reed, I, I was very lucky to have Reed help me with that. You had a very special mentor and one of the best, I think, in, in Dave Goldberg. How do you think about getting mentors now and how, do you, how are you pulling mentors around you as you start Gixo? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I've found um, that obviously the mentors becomes more and more important. I will say that, um, that taking someone's input and advice and thoughtfulness, even when they've passed, has also been important. I was going to a meeting on Friday, and I was just debating. The person I was meeting with was somebody who I thought may be doing something competitive with our new startup, and I was thinking, what should I do? And I remember Dave saying to me, it's all about the execution. Ideas are a dime a dozen. And I said, okay, screw it. And I'm going to walk into this meeting and be like completely open as possible with the person. And I ended up having one of the most productive conversations about the space. And um, we're looking at health, wellness, and fitness. And um, and so you know, making sure, with, from my perspective, it's not just about having those mentors. It's making sure that you're listening and making sure you're taking their input. And when you're really debating how to how to do that. Um, you know, for me, I also feel like that um, I've had my father who's been a mentor, but also there's, um, you know, I feel like there's a lot of, we'll see Aileen right there, there's a lot of wonderful women in Silicon Valley who have made themselves available. But it's a lot about it being willing to reach out. And the one thing I tell entrepreneurs who are reaching out to me all the time, too, is be specific with your questions. Um, the more you can ask a mentor somebody something very, very specific, the more likely they are going to be to respond to you and take the time. Um, and I think that's been also helpful in trying to create that network. Yeah, that's interesting. That's different than my experience with Reed especially. Because I would, the way Reed and I met each other is that a friend of ours sent us an email that said, John, Reed, you should meet. And uh, I take those emails really seriously, especially if they're very short like that. And so Reed and I just started having breakfast and we found we had a list of things to talk about going in. And we'd talk about some of them, and we'd always end up with a list that was longer at after breakfast than when we started. And so we had to schedule another breakfast. And so maybe Reed's unusual, and maybe our relationship's unusual, but yeah. like my, my experience has been that mentorship, the most surprising lessons come from things that you're not asking about and you don't know you should ask about. So it was interesting. Yeah, that's, I think that's a great, that's true. I think, though, often when you're trying to make that intro to someone, it's like if you're going in with something specific to right. at least kick off the conversation, it's helpful. Depends on the referrer, I guess. <laughs> the, um, and so the last thing I should finish with, I want to finish with is, so, you know, you've scaled some very large companies and huge impact. Gixo now is, uh, you know, two, two people. <laughs> you, you and your former co-founder, our current co-founder, Al Lieb. Um, what are you going to take from the companies that you scaled? What are you doing now? you're taking from those lessons? So I'd say the, um, one of the biggest things that we did was establish up front. We sat down, which we definitely did not do, and we started. So we started Evite together 19 years ago. Is still at Stanford, so, um, and we haven't worked together in 15 years. And so we were looking at, we sat down, and I said, okay, one of the things that I took away from Dave was thinking about up front, what is the company that you want to build? Um, and I feel like enough co-founders don't sit down up front and say, you know, what do we? What is the mission that we're actually trying to go after? What's important in terms of the people we're actually going to hire if we hire? What is our? What are we willing to do from an exit strategy perspective? Because I think if you look at founders that break up, which is one of the biggest impacts to investors, is when founders fight. It's because they didn't have enough of those conversations up front. And establishing literally day one, the first thing we did was sit down and talked about the type of company that we wanted to build. And that was one of the biggest things that I learned is because if you scale and if you're thinking about the long term, you want to have those discussions right away. Um, and I would say, again, I think the second big thing is, is really, really 
spending that time thinking about the and working through competition and customer fit and a lot more on that um, and the business model than I think that especially as two engineers we would have naturally done. <laughs> it's funny because it's, it's fun to visit you and Al because you, you're so clearly going to build a big company but you're so willing to be patient when it's just the two of you so that's, that, that's uh, good advice. So cool, that, that's all we had. So um, thank you very much, Lena. Thank Appreciate you guys. It.